Good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight and showing an interest in the Reading Police Department and our statistics for over the last uh, of 2015. Um, I apologize, we did not do one of these at the end of 2015. Um, we had a couple little complications. One of them is that my crime statistician um, had a baby and decided to stay home and be a mom. So uh, we have a new crime statistician, Mike Murphy, who's sitting over here on the end. Um, Mike does the PowerPoint slides that you'll see tonight. He's also your access when you're a neighborhood watch group if you want crime statistics um, in your neighborhood and other things. Mikey's the guy that will get that for you. Um, we'll talk a little bit about our computer system tonight and some of the complications of that. But overall, uh, Mike is very responsive to the community and will uh, try to get you whatever he can. So the second thing that happened this year, and we'll talk a little bit more and it's part of our accomplishments, is the move to the new Robert P. Blankenship Police Facility, which has turned out to be a great asset for our department and a good morale builder for the officers that uh, go to work every day in that. Does that make it harder for you guys to see the screen, that light? No? Okay. So, is that better? Okay. Mikey, my clicker's not working. Mikey, my clicker's not working. Okay, it's turned on now, so now maybe it'll work. Okay, so let's talk about uh, calls for service and response time of the Reading Police Department. Calls for service are the best measure that we have of overall workload of the police department that we can measure. If you look at this graph, this is several years ago. This is now. So we've had about a roughly 9,000 call for service increase since 2008 to the Reading Police Department. That equates to directly to what you see in response time from the police department. And you can see that our response times, this is for priority one calls. So if you look at the calls for service of the Reading Police Department, they get qualified as priority zero, one, two, three, and four. Priority zero calls are true emergency calls. That is taking place right now, a homicide in progress. Priority zero is not a real gauge statistically because we only get about 25 a year. You're talking about 1,200 and 1,300 calls when it comes to priority one. So we use that as our emergency response time because it's a much more accurate gauge. And if you look, this last year we were at 1,558 as an average response time to an emergency call, and we actually dropped this year to 1,453. At the same time, we had about 1,000 call for service decrease. So that may have a little bit to do with it, but I think that uh, we're, we're actually seeing some improvement on our response time, but our calls for service continue to go up. And they've been going up since AB 109 and now Prop 47. And we'll talk about those more as we go through the program itself. So let's get into the actual crime statistics. These are our Part 1 crimes that we saw in 2015. What's that Zoom thing in there for? So I've got a buttons on this. I don't know what I'm doing with. Um, this is our total Part 1 crimes, 4,783. This is our property crimes. So this big sweep, this is when prison realignment came in, the year after, and now you see property crime starting to go up because this is where Proposition 47 came into play. Remember Proposition 47, which was passed by the voters last November, turned commercial burglary to a misdemeanor unless it passed 900 bucks. It turned all of our possession of simple drug, simple drug possession crimes to misdemeanors. It turned a lot of our felonies to misdemeanors. And we're starting to see that reflected in our property crime statistics. I will tell you, I was at the California Police Chiefs Conference a couple of weeks ago, and what we're experiencing in Reading is sm much smaller compared to what cities in LA are facing. Some of those chiefs down there were telling me about 30% increases in property crime since Proposition 47 took effect. Actually, I read an article the other day, San Francisco has one of the highest property crime increases in the country because since Proposition 47 went into play. Violent crime, we're still sitting relatively flat year to year to year as we have. I did a town hall meeting a couple years ago and we put violent crime up since 1971 and our violent crime rate has stayed relatively steady 
all the way through with a spike in the early 90s when there was some gang violence here that, that Bob Blankenship took care of when, back when he was chief. But this is where we have our big concern. And when we go out and I talk, do a lot of public speaking in the community, I hear about property crime, property crime, property crime, property crime. And where I'm concerned on this number, as I've said for the last couple of years, is that we're concerned about the underreporting of our property crime. When people tell me, Chief, I've been the victim of a crime six, seven times, but I don't even call to bother you guys with it anymore. That concerns me that we're not accurately measuring, engaging how much property crime is actually taking place in our community. So let's drill down to this a little bit more. Violent crimes. Mikey loves animation. Isn't this cool? So when you look at, this is our violent crime for this year compared to years past. So if you look at homicides, we had two last year. Majority of the homicides that we've had since I've been chief of police, and this is going on year five, have been committed by family members against family members. We are fortunate in the fact that in our community, we do not have a lot of random violence that takes place in our community. So when I was talking to those other chiefs that are struggling with you know, double-digit property crime increases, they're also struggling with double-digit gang violence homicides as well. We are dealing with property crime. Our rape statistics, we went up from, 50 to 50, from 52 to 50 over one year to the next. But there's a little bit of artificiality in that, in that the Bureau of Crime Statistics actually recomputed or redefined how we report rape statistics. So before it was a completed rape, now an attempt counts as a rape. Just like a few years ago, auto burglary got recomputed in the way they did it, so it threw off our statistics a little bit. So this is still a bad statistic, because one rape is too many. But uh, if you're going to turn a negative to a positive, most of these rape reports that come to us come through one safe place. And the work that they do in actually advocating for rape victims to report it to the police department so that we can capture these and get the person prosecuted for the crime is a great asset to this police department in this community because rape is a very highly underreported crime. And the fact that we're capturing them and we can hold people accountable for that, although the rape is a negative, the fact that we're capturing it is actually a positive. Robberies, we had 145 last year as opposed to 142 the year before. So when you look at a 6.5% overall crime increase for the city of Reading, if you talk about raw numbers, that's about 250 crimes. So let's talk percentages and, and raw numbers because if we have two homicides and when we have four, we have a 100% increase. Whereas a community that has 70 and now has 75 has much less percentage, but which community do you want to live in? So we'll talk raw numbers and we'll talk percentages. The biggest portion, oh, that's why I'm pushing the wrong button. Mikey, fix it. Um, this is the biggest portion of our property crime right here, or our, our violent crime is still aggravated assault. We had 417 aggravated assaults last year, and a majority of those still, about 25% of those, are domestic violence. Domestic violence continues to be a problem in the city of Reading and Shasta County in total. And domestic violence is very difficult, as I've told this group many times before, it's very difficult for us to deal with because those crimes take place in the home where there's constitutional protections to keep me out. So those are things that we work, again, we work with One Safe Place and other advocacy groups to try to break that cycle of violence because often these are multiple victims over and over and over because they feel like they're stuck in that cycle of violence and we need to find ways to get them out of that. Property crimes, this is where we had our big increase. And I'm going to shed a little light on this that we've, we've shined over the last several years that I've been doing these town hall meetings. The biggest portion of our property crime remains general larceny or general theft. We've seen a flip-flop over the last couple of years of burglary goes down, motor vehicle theft goes up. Motor vehicle theft goes down, burglary goes up. And I think that has a lot to do with who we arrest and whether or not they go to prison or whether or not they stay in the community. Um, Detective Tim Renault arrested a guy the other night um, for burglary. He was arrested. He started to interview him relative to the crimes that he was accused of. And the guy said, and I quote, if you said I did them, I did them. I've done so many, I've lost track. So when it comes to burglary, you know, we, we say that if we catch them for one, they've probably done five, 50. So it really is a matter of if you can get the right prolific criminal and lock them up, you can have a direct impact and a drastic impact on the property crime that you're seeing. But it also has to do with crime prevention. And when I became chief um, four years ago, when we did this presentation, 50% of these burglaries that you see up here had no forced entry. 
which means we're leaving our doors and windows open, making it easy for them to come and steal from us. Now, we've gotten better. We're at 39% have no forced entry, but we still have room to, grow, room to improve. The fact of the matter is, and I've said this before in these town hall meetings, is that Reading used to be a place where you could leave your doors and windows open and leave your keys in the car. And I hate to be the one to break the news, but it's not that way anymore. The world has changed. We are dismantling our criminal justice system in the state of California to make less and less punishment for crimes because we have a prison population problem. And we have to be able to protect ourselves from a crime prevention standpoint. And when we go to the next slide, I'm going to break down what types of crimes we have, and I'm going to show you something that's pretty sobering. About almost 50% of our general thefts take place from a motor vehicle, which means we're leaving our stuff inside of our vehicles and making it easy for them to take it. Now, should you be able to leave your stuff in your car? Absolutely. Can you anymore? No, you can't. You have to think from that crime prevention standpoint and start looking at what is in my car? Is my car ster sterile when I leave? What can they take? Because if it looks good to you, it's going to look good to them. And we literally have criminals that walk around the community that are just trying doors waiting to open for a door to open so they can steal. And if you, what is the root causal level of most of that? If you really look at our general property thief in the city of Reading, it comes down to addiction to methamphetamine and heroin. That is the root causal issue of most of our property crime and quite frankly, most of our violent crime because a lot of that domestic violence that you see, there's drugs involved. And a lot of that violence that you see, there's drugs or mental illness involved or both. So that is still gonna be a huge issue that we have to try to crack the nut on in this community is how do we get more drug treatment capacity? How do we get more mental health capacity? And how do we give the sheriff me the resources as a, as a police department to deliver the proper service to you, but how do we get the sheriff the adequate jail bed space so we can hold these people accountable? And that's gonna be the root cause of most of this is drugs. So arrests last year show exactly what we thought was going to happen. And I said this last year at the town hall meeting with Proposition 47 coming in, our misdemeanor arrests were gonna go up and our felony arrests were gonna go down simply because most things aren't felonies anymore. Our total arrests went up significantly, but Proposition 47 is creating this. Proposition 47 was designed to take lower level offenses, make them misdemeanors, and not create criminals out of drug addicts. The problem is, is you've also taken away a judge's ability to order somebody to rehabilitation. So it's, I think it's having the opposite effect because a lot of the people, and I'm going to have Susan Cain come up here and talk in a little bit about the day reporting center that's a probation program for those that are going through rehabilitation and the successes that we're seeing on the right side of court that for those of you that have been to town hall meetings, I've talked about the success on the right side of court as opposed to our challenges on the left side of court. So if you think about arrest here, court is the middle and rehabilitation is the right side of court. Here's where I think we're starting to see some success. The challenge is we can't get them to court because we don't have the capacity to hold them in jail until they go through the court process. When you go to a DRC graduation, and the last one I went to, they had 16 graduates, which is a huge increase. They've gone double, almost doubled every time that they've had a graduation. Almost every one of those people said, I came to this program kicking and screaming because I did not want to be here. And now I'm off drugs. I have my job. My family and I are back together. And my life is going the way that it should. But I want you to focus on that kicking and screaming part because we just took away a judge's ability to do that in order for them to rehabilitation. So although we want to decriminalize the act of being addicted to drugs, we're limiting a judge's ability to get them the help that they need, and I still think that that's going to lead to a lot of these problems. But this is exactly what we thought was going to happen with our arrests last year because of Proposition 47 and the change of most felony crimes to misdemeanors. So last year, one of the things that came out in the blueprint for public safety is that we should report what types of internal affairs complaints that we have. Because of the Peace Officer Bill of Rights, I can't tell you what the outcome of these is. I can't tell you what the actual complaints were. All I can give you is some numbers. So. Last year, we had three complaints for excessive force out of, go back one, 8,288 arrests. So that is less than 0.04% of our total arrests that we made last year resulted in a complaint of excessive force. 
Unfortunately, I'd love to be able to tell you what the outcome of those investigations are, but I can't. We had three complaints for conduct, rude and discourteous. Out of 94,000 calls for service, we got three complaints, citizen-generated complaints against the department for rude and discourteous. And then we had one guy that filed a complaint for um, racial bias. Um, and I'd love to be able to tell you about that one, but I can't. So, in compliance with the blueprint and some of the things that they outlined, here's how many complaints we had last year. We had seven citizen-generated complaints for 94,000 calls for service. I think that's a pretty good rate. So some of the changes that we've made and some of the tools that we've done is, is uh, in response to some things that have come up um, in the communities, a lot of them from talking to the Shasta Support Services folks and trying to get um, some action on shopping carts and homeless camps and other things. Um, we actually created web reporting tools that Mike Murphy has been absolutely wonderful um, in putting together and our volunteer, Matt Morgan, that put together our website um, actually is able to once we get the idea, these two guys threw the stuff together in like a day, day and a half. So you can now, if you go to report a crime, you can actually report a crime. There's also a really big button on there. So I hate online reporting. If you're the victim of a crime in my community as a police chief, I want you to see a member of the Reading Police Department to let you know, number one, that we care, that it's important to us, and that we're going to investigate that crime. Unfortunately, today's world and our, our depleted staffing makes online reporting almost a necessity. The problem is we're not getting enough of it. So you can file a report online in about 20 minutes. So if you're a victim of a crime, please use the online reporting so we get a true picture and at least we can measure the crimes that have taken place. You can report abandoned, abandoned vehicles on our website. That sends an email to our abandoned vehicle abatement CSO and she goes out, tags it, 30, 72 hours later she goes and picks it up. She removes about 1,500 vehicles a year um, from the city of Reading that would otherwise be sitting in our streets. You can report a transient camp. Those emails, what Mike Murphy does is he goes and balances those against public and private property. Right now I have Bob Brandon with the exception of some uh, community cleanups that we've done with, in cooperation with the Indian Hill subdivision. Um, we've restricted Bob to a public open space simply because he doesn't have enough time to do anything else. Um, Bob Brandon, and we'll get to this in the accomplishments later, I'll show you guys how much garbage he actually removed from transient camps in public open space and it's a little staggering. You can also report a shopping cart. And what this system does, it actually doesn't create much workload for the police department. Mike Murphy went through and actually contacted all the stores that we have a problem with to see if they wanted to be a part of this program. So you get the name of the store that the cart belongs to, you hit that button, you fill in the store, you tell them, you pick the store you want off the list of those that are participating, you tell them where the cart is, you can even include a picture, and it sends an email directly to the store because it's the store that's responsible to pick them up and not leave them out in the community. So this was a community tool that we put together um, that Matt Morgan and I kind of had a brainchild moment at a council meeting when Dale was talking about um, shopping carts. And we actually came up with this and Matt had it put together with Mike Murphy in a day. It took Mike Murphy a heck of a lot longer than that to contact all the grocery stores and get their permission and get their enrollment. And if you don't see your grocery store that's part of that list, Go talk to the store managers and tell them they should be part of it because it's their responsibility as business owners to help keep our community clean and not leave their carts laying all over our community when people take them off their stores. And North State Grocery is one of the best that's been actually participating with us in this and being very responsive about getting, getting their carts and getting them picked up. Neighborhood Watch. Um, last year, or over the last couple of years, Jason Schroeder has just been great with volunteering with the Reading Police Department and helping us in attending Neighborhood Watch meetings. Um, good thing for Jason, bad thing for us, his business has taken off and he doesn't have the time to do it anymore. So luckily for us, we have two very nice people who are sitting right over there, Terry and Richard. Stand up, raise your hand. Right there. That have volunteered to take his place. So Terry came up with an idea and her and Mike Murphy worked together. Um, and you, you get the idea by how much I'm talking. Mike Murphy's a part-time employee. Um, so you see how much he does with, you know, four hours a day. But Mike Murphy, because he was a volunteer before he became a part-time employee, he still gets paid for about half his day and is there majority of the day, um, sometimes longer than I am. But we won't talk about that. Um, but you can actually go onto our website 
and see where, your, where all of our neighborhood watch programs are that are en enrolled with the police department. You can find out if your neighborhood has a neighborhood watch program. You can find out who the neighborhood watch captains are. You can communicate with Barbara Crumrine, who's my CSO, that coordinates the neighborhood watch programs. And you can actually find out, number one, if your neighborhood has a neighborhood watch program. We can put you in touch with that neighborhood watch captain so you can start to participate. And if your community doesn't have a neighborhood watch program and you want to start one, we can work and get Terry and Richard out there to help you guys get that, get that rolling. Terry's also working on a program now. We're doing neighborhood watch captains meetings, and we're starting to reinvent those now that Terry is, is part of it. But she's also working with the business community to split up a citywide business watch into downtown, Hilltop Drive, Dana Drive, into smaller groups that can have a little bit more impact on their, on their general area rather than telling everybody downtown what's taking place on Hilltop Drive and getting all of that coordinated and then having neighborhood or business watch captains that will attend the neighborhood watch captains with us. So we'll have a merging of our business community and our residences to talk about, give direct impact and direct feedback to me on a more consistent basis than these big meetings so that we can direct resources and do things a little bit better to service you as a community in general. So the Reading Police Department last year, we had a very busy year, very, very busy. And Mike and I actually worked very hard to keep this presentation down to about 30 to 40 minutes. So I'm actually looking pretty good on time so that we don't keep you here until 9.30 at night. I know that there's like a baseball game on tonight that some of you probably want to get to. So last year, I talked about this already. Um, we moved into the Reading Police Department, the Robert P. Blankenship um, Patrol Building. And it, our non-essential functions are now in City Hall non-essential meaning me, um, our admin group, investigations, and our records are in City Hall. The building that was built, the Robert P. Blankenship building, houses patrol and property evidence. And I say this kind of derailed the town hall meeting because I want to give you guys an aspect of what it takes to move a police department. We have almost 200,000 individual pieces of evidence that have to be individually cataloged, organized, and moved from one place to another, reorganized, cataloged, and put into the new bins. Fortunately, we planned ahead. And uh, the rolling property evidence shelves, for those of you that came to the opening and actually went through a tour of the building, all the stuff that was stuck in every crack and, crack and crevice of the old building that barely fit, that the girls had trouble even finding our evidence once they stored it, now only fills one third of our capacity. So we've planned for the future. Um, that, that, uh, that building will last us well into the future. Right now, we have 102 uniformed personnel in the department. Um, we have capacity for almost 190 uniformed officers in the, in the new building with lockers. And we have the ability to expand that if we need to. So we really have thought ahead with this building. Um, we used uh, drug seizure money to uh, outfit a gym. So we have in-shape cops and the guys are, the officers are loving it. There's a lot more people in there doing CrossFit and other things now so that they can stay in shape so that when they have to fight these suspects, they're, they're ready to do so. We also finished our dual band radio upgrade. So for those of you who haven't been to a town hall meeting yet, when I became the chief of police, the Reading Police Department actually got forced to go to 800 megahertz high band radios, but the sheriff's department, because high band doesn't bend into canyons, was on low band, and our radios wouldn't talk to each other. So a Reading police officer could be standing next to him as a sheriff's deputy, he's not a sheriff's deputy, he's one of my cadets, but I'm using him as an example, um, could not talk back and forth on, to, on their radios. They had to relay, relay everything through Shascom. So with the support of the sheriff and the Anderson police chief, we have actually got 100% grant funding, about $650,000 to replace every single one of our radios with a dual band radio. So now when we do coordination with canines, SWAT, and other operations with the sheriff's department, we can actually talk to them on the radio, which is invaluable for our guys in the field. Our records management system, our computer system in the Reading Police Department was put in place in 1986 and it has not been upgraded much since. They've kept it running and it was state of the art at the time, but it is not state of the art today. Um, we have, in partnership with the sheriff, and this isn't just my computer system, this is mine, the sheriff's, and the city of Anderson's. So the whole county is on a 1986 computer system. So for Mike Murphy to even be able to do these slides is an arduous process of writing program code and pulling data out of a computer to manually verify it to put together these slides. So it takes quite a while just to put this together, put together something that should take about 10 keystrokes to put together and pull that information out. Um, we started a process with state funds that we've been slowly accumulating three years ago. 
Um, this project for the county is going to cost about $2.2 .2 million. And we, with very little general fund expenditure in the end, we're going to be able to upgrade that computer system for the entire county. We will actually have real-time data. So we have gone through, we've done the needs assessment with a consultant. We have written the request for proposal that's been issued and responded to. And we have done vendor selection in Spillman Technologies out of Provo, Utah was selected for that. And we will start that implementation process. We're in contract negotiations with them right now. And we'll start that implementation process and hope to have it complete somewhere around September of 2017. That is a lot longer than I want it to be. And everybody has heard me and my department scream about that implementation timeline. But when you have six vendors that apply and every vendor has the same timeline, just different costs and different modules, it shows you that if you want it done right, you got to let the kind of let it run its course. So I'd like to have it in place yesterday, but we're going to go from a very antiquated system. Shascom's CAD dispatch is 16 years old. Our system is much older than that. It will all be on one central database now from jail management to CAD dispatch, computer aided dispatch, um, to crime analysis, to our report writing. Everything will be on the same database and everything will work. Um, when our guys run somebody on their mobile data computer in the car, instead of getting a bunch of data and trying to confirm social security numbers and dates of birth and things like that, they'll have their latest booking photo. And it's real easy then to look at the guy in the back seat and say, dude, that's not you. Why don't you start telling the truth? It'll link with our blue check so we can do field identification, field fingerprint identification in the field, and we'll get real-time data. Kings County just implemented Spillman Technologies. Their sheriff gave his first um, update on crime to the... Uh, Board of Supervisors, he brought up the executive dashboard, and as he's briefing the Board of Supervisors, one of them actually said, hey, um, Sheriff, the numbers are changing. And he said, that's because it's real-time data and the guys are out taking reports. So it'll give us much better data and crime analysis capability and reporting, and there's a public portal. So that you guys will be able to, now that we'll have good, easy-to-access data, we'll actually be able to go look and run crime stats for your neighborhood through that public portal with this system when it's in place. So it'll be a huge improvement, and we're well on our way to making that happen. We put the abandoned cart reporting tool on there. Like I said, that was a collaboration. Um, that was, you know, Dale was, was going out collecting tons and tons and tons of shopping carts, and this was, you know, just a brainchild that we came up with, and we've actually had 125 carts reported on that since January. The illegal uh, camp reporting tool, that came in towards the end of 2014. Um, and has been, we've had over 400 transient camps reported on that that Bob Brandon has gone and taken care of since it was, since its inception. Bob Brandon last year removed over 30 tons of garbage from public open space from transient camps in the city of Reading last year. So there's been some talk about how we shouldn't enforce camping ordinances and we shouldn't go clean this stuff up. But imagine in one year that's 150,000 pounds of trash. In two years, that's 300,000 pounds of trash. In four, do the math as you go forward. If we don't go clean it up, the amount of blight and stuff that it creates for our community. I think we need to find some solutions, but we still have to clean up the trash because we have to protect the beauty of our community. And tourism and other things and the beauty that draws people here are part of our economic base, and we need to be able to protect that. We created the Neighborhood Police Unit. Um, council gave us four positions on two years out of the reserve. I'll talk a little bit more detail about this after Susan's done talking about the Day Reporting Center, and I'll show you some of the things that they've actually been doing over the last, we finally got everybody hired, got the people trained, and we recreated that unit in January, and we'll go over some of their statistics for the past eight weeks. This is another one that I'm gonna hit after Susan because we have a slide for it. Um, one of our sergeants, based on what was happening back east, had an idea to create a force options class Force options is what we call our defensive tactics and other things for citizens groups to give them an understanding of what it looks like from our side of the badge. And I'll, I'll give you, I have some pictures and some videos and other things that will show you guys that that'll show you what that is and what the effect has been so far. And then I'm, we are now up to, since this was highlighted in the uh, blueprint for public safety, we've gone over 1600 new followers on Facebook over the last year and social media is big in law enforcement now. So we just kind of wanted to highlight that that is growing. If you want to, like the Reading Police Department so that everything that we put on our Facebook page relates right back to you. And we try to keep, we try to put as much of our news releases on there as possible so you get your news directly from the police department as it happens. But we also highlight things like Helen Klinger, who's over 90 years old and has been a volunteer at the police department for over 35 years. And you know, nice things like that where you see 
people giving back to their community through the police department. And then I wanted to highlight this tonight because I talk about that success on the right side of court. The Day Reporting Center right now, um, when you talk about recidivism rate, this has been, it was, if you remember a couple years ago, if you were here, I had a big hairball with the state of California over their definition of recidivism. Their definition of recidivism means, says that a person, in order to be a recidivist or be counted, they have to be convicted of a crime, a new crime. Well, that means that I can commit 25 burglaries, never show up to court, never be convicted, therefore I'm not a recidivist. I say that's wrong. It should be a rearrest rate. And if you look at the Day Reporting Center and what I want to talk about her programs, um, they've graduated 69 now, and their recidivism rate is 14.7%, which is very, very low when you calculate recidivism. And that is not reconviction, that is rearrest. So I'm going to let Susan come up to the microphone and tell you a little bit about the Day Reporting Center, and then when she's done, we'll go over the Neighborhood Police Unit and the, uh, the Force Options class. Lenny, can you get that mic turned up a little bit? Try again. Hello. It's on. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Um, I'm Susan Kane. I'm the program manager for the Shasta Day Reporting Center. And thank you very much for having me here tonight. I appreciate it. I come from a background of law enforcement. I come from the Pearl Division. And I just retired a couple of years ago. So I, I do have the perspective of law enforcement. So you would never think that I would be the manager of a program. But this is the only program that I've seen in all my years of law enforcement where we ever saw success for these guys coming out of prison and coming out of the jails. So when I retired from parole, I wanted to be involved in this because I've hooked and booked for so many years and saw these people having their kids starting coming back through parole and through probation. And after seeing this program in San Joaquin County where I had come from and I knew it was up here, I wanted to be involved in it. So I have my staff here with me today, and they're going to hand out a few flyers, if you guys want to get up and hand those out for me, to give you some information, because I don't have a gorgeous PowerPoint up here. So one of the things I'm handing out to you is just a handout of where the different day reporting centers are in the state. But, the sh but every day reporting center has its own character. And the Shasta Day Reporting Center, I'd hold up our model to any day reporting center in the state. We work really well with the sheriff's department, the probation department, the police department. And your county is really lucky to have those kind of relations between the agencies. Because I've been up and down the state, and I worked in several counties in parole. And those types of relationships, as a norm, aren't there. So you have these agencies working really close together to take a look at these issues that are happening in your community. The main goal of the Shasta Day Reporting Center is to protect the public by providing criminal offenders a combination of supervision, reporting, and intensive treatment. Our program is based off what they call criminogenic needs. A lot of that research started coming out of the National Institute of Corrections back in the 90s. You started seeing parole get some of it. You started seeing probation start to use some of it. So it's based on what they see as criminogenic needs, that these are types of needs that these guys coming out that we have to fill, that we have to teach. And it's about and criminogenic and cognitive thinking. It's about thinking. It's not about getting a job. It's not about staying clean. There were many times in parole when I had somebody in front of me that had a job and was clean, and then sure enough, a few months later, everything's downhill. And what all the evidence has been coming out is saying that there's two main needs. One is criminal thinking and one is associates. It's who you hang out with, and the other one is how you think. And these individuals, for some reason, weren't taught how to make good decisions, weren't taught about good processes, and now make bad decisions. So our job at the Day Reporting Center is to give them the skills, the tools, to make better decisions and to be successful in the community. Now, the staff that you see, and I have Martin Sell with me here that helps me with the, the sober living environments as well, we try to close all the loopholes. They're all educated. We all have different kinds of experiences. And we give these guys assessments. So it's not like a program where in years gone by, they'd go to a program and they would be just shotgun with all these different services. These guys get individual assessments that can tell us what exactly the criminogenic needs are so we can give them the programming 
to assess that. So one of the handouts that you're getting is just an overview of the Shasta Day Reporting Center that gives you more detail as to what I'm talking about tonight. Um, it talks about the different kind of programming. All our programming is evidence-based. Evidence-based was a term that started coming out in the 90s, and it started coming out in probation, it started coming out in parole, and what it's saying is the programs that we are utilizing are not just an experiment, are not just something that we think might work well for somebody. They're actually tried, true, and we keep statistics on them to make sure that we're actually getting the bang for our buck. We're using programs of um, cognitive restructuring, of thinking for a change, things that give them the skills, that give them the, the thinking processes to make better decisions, to be positive in the community, to have a pro-social life so they aren't out there victimizing. There's, as you'll see in that one flyer, there is all kinds of different um, programs. It talks about daily check-ins, anger management, parenting, community connections. We do community service with Martin Sells Group. He puts together widow helpers, and there's all different programs that are listed in there that we utilize in order to prepare them to be positive in the community. Um, it talks about going through different phases. And we'll talk a little bit about more as the statistics are, but they go through different phases. So when they enter the program, they're in phase one. And all the evidence show that if you front load services, that you'll have a much higher chance of success with these individuals than if you just say, oh, just come in a couple hours a day. So they come in, I mean, a couple hours a week. They come in seven days a week. They're checking in seven days a week. We're open Monday through Friday, 8 to 8, and on the weekends, Saturday and Sunday, 12 to 5. So our job is not only to give them the tools, but to hold them accountable. And when we're having difficulty with accountability, I'm calling the sheriff's department. I'm calling the police department. I'm calling the probation department so that we can get their support. And then these offenders are seeing that, hey, it's just not about me, an ex-cop, trying to get them to do the right thing. All of us as a community are involved in trying to reduce recidivism so that there are less victims out in the community. Do I have an extra copy of the statistics? Can I have one? One handout that you got is regarding the statistics. We took a look at 2016. So as you can see, we, I gave you the statistics from phase one, which is when they enter to aftercare. So they go through phase one, phase two, and phase three until they get to graduation and then into aftercare. So if you look at the statistics for check-in, which means that's when they have to start coming in seven days a week, they started out at 71%, but towards the end, um, and, and when they were in aftercare, they were at 95% for sobriety. They had a 28% sobriety rate. By the time they were done in the aftercare program, they were at 100% sobriety. They're not going to get to graduate and go into aftercare unless they've become clean and sober. When you look at employment, 43% came in employed. When they finished the program, they were at 91%. So, and this program can go as short as long as that individual chooses. If they want to make the commitment to change and we see that they're actually changing, they could be done in six to nine months. There can be some that are still in the program at 18 months. Okay, but then we're working with the other entities to see what's going on and how can we get them to be successful? What more can we do? So you can see just by those specific statistics how the program is leading them towards success. The latter statistic um, the chief talked about a little bit was recidivism. As you see, there's a 54% recidivism rate in one of the latest reports that I saw for California. Now, when I was in parole, I don't know, we averaged between 65 and 85%. So I think that latest report is the least I've ever seen in all my 30 years. So I'm not sure exactly where those numbers come from. But I would venture to say, just from past history, chief, it's probably, probably the more. change in the definition. Yeah, it's probably for, absolutely, there's a good point. We changed the definition. So when the definition was what it used to be, um, we were hitting 85%. But if you look at our, we had six, we've had 69 graduates since the program opened in March 2013. Of those graduates, we have a 14.7 recidivism rate. And with 
the definition change, and as the chief talked to you about it, when we're talking about recidivism, we want to look at true recidivism, recidivism, what's really happening in the community. And so we're including re-arrests. We're including violations. We're including everything that took them back before the court because we really want to see what's happening in the community. And when we looked at all our graduates, we looked at a 14.7 recidivism rate. We talked raw figures. We had 69 offenders. 10 offenders have re-entered the system at some point. But of that, if we look at, at the recidivism by the state, only two were convicted and sent to prison. But we had six new arrests, one probation violation, and one work violation, work release violation. So the true recidivism, well not true, the recidivism per the state definition is only a couple percent. With our definition, it's 14.7, which is hugely lower than what the norm is for recidivism for offenders. So our goal at the Shasta DRC, we want to provide that participant with the tools, with the skills, with the cognitive changes, so that they can have a pro-social lifestyle, so they can be successful for on a long-term basis. So when they're 80, they're looking back saying, okay, I made the right changes, I got my life. And what that leads to is less victimization in the community. So, thank you, Thank Susan. you. One of the other programs that Marta McKenzie, before she retired and I actually got included into the CCP program, was the housing program too, because I think that if you take somebody out of prison, and you make a homeless, you know, ex-con, parolee, whatever you want to call them, what are they going to do? They're going to go back to crime to support themselves. Um, that program that Marta and I actually got in there has now housed over 100 people um, that, are, that are part of probation's caseload um, to get, keep them off the street and house them, and they've been housed for over 30 days. So that's a good program, and we're going to keep that going. So, But the Day Reporting Center, I want to kind of be, be able to bring in not just what the police department's doing, but what some of our community assets and partners are doing that are very successful in that program along with the Sheriff's Step Up program where they can actually get jail credit for going to college. And the partnership, uh, the Shasta College just got a, a big grant to increase that Step Up program with the Sheriff. And the Sheriff's in the back. If you have any questions about that, you can, you can ask him. I'm sure he'll come up and answer those. But that has been very, very successful as well. So let's talk a little bit about our force options class. So, you know, obviously we've re we all read the news and we see all the reports from Ferguson and other places that have shed a bad light on law enforcement over the last year and a half. Sergeant Casey Bokovich, um, who is my training sergeant and a um, court expert in use of force for police, came up with an idea to actually give our training to citizens. We have the Regional Peace Officer Standards and Training Force Options Trainer. It's actually a big video screen where you can do don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot scenarios with um, simulated weapons that actually are what we use in our police department. So far, this, we've had the ACLU go through, and they sent representatives from San Francisco up to see what little old Redding was doing because they liked the program so much. SCAR has gone through it. We've sent elected officials. Every year, we have been holding a class for the grand juries, and we actually have interest from the state of California's grand jury training coordinator um, that wants to come and view the program because they may make it a state mandate for grand juries statewide so they get an understanding of what happens on the other side of the badge. Um, we have got inquiries. This, this uh, program was featured in Force Science News, which is a nationwide trade publication for force uh, options instructors. It was just recently featured on the cover of California Police Chiefs Magazine um, for other, to give ideas for other departments to emulate. Um, we have interest in, from Peace Officer Standards and Training have come up and viewed it on several occasions. Telemundo just did a, a uh, report. Uh, we had the Hispanic Coalition go through the program. We've done it for Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs and others, and it has been very, very eye-opening for everybody that goes through it. And recently, um, we may have an option for some uh, legislators from Sacramento from the Public Safety Committee to come and go through a program that Sergeant Bokovich thought of. We have got inquiries from about 50 agencies nationwide um, from as far east as Washington, D.C., wanting our PowerPoint slide, wanting our program, and wanting to know what we're doing so that we can educate the community about what it's like to be on the other side of the badge when you're in these critical incidents and what takes place so people can kind of understand and see all the legal requirements and everything that a police officer has to deal with when they make that decision to use force, but also the psychological effect of the officers after the fact, especially in a critical incident that the community doesn't really realize with the criminal investigation and an administrative investigation and the lawsuits and everything else. There's a lot of strain 
that goes on to the psyche of a police officer after they're involved in a critical incident, and we actually describe to them what programs that we have to help those officers deal with those circumstances. So it is very valuable, and if you are part of a community group that would like to go through it, um, Sergeant Casey Bokovich is the contact in the Reading Police Department, and my assistant Mary, who's sitting right over there, can get you linked with him um, if you want to do that. And then these are all headlines from the record searchlight over the last six weeks created by the Neighborhood Police Unit. Six weeks. This is what proactive cops can do in six weeks. And since I roped them into being here tonight, I'll introduce them to you. They're in the back. They're led by Sergeant Bullington. Corporal Jacoby, who's peeking around the corner there, was talking on the phone. <laughs> Officer Garrett Maxwell. <laughs> Officer Boone. And if you saw how many vowels are in his name, you know why I shortened it. Officer Nick Day and Officer John Sheldon. <laughs> this is the work that these guys have been able to do. Sergeant Bullington. Um, was also one of the key people that helped the DA's office put the case against the Redding Inn that is going to hopefully change the way that that operator does business so that his business does not negatively affect the residences and the businesses around him. So let's go into a little bit more of what they've done over the last six weeks. They've made 29, they've contacted 29 people with drugs, they've seized one firearm, five other weapons, and these are the contacts they've made. Eight gang members, 30 that are on AB 109 release, 17 on parole, and 109 contacts in six weeks that are people that are on probation, and they're cons consistently checking them or making arrests on them where appropriate. In six weeks, those guys standing right back there have made 160 arrests. They've also seized 143 grams of methamphetamine, 7 pounds of marijuana, 3 grams of heroin, and recently 12 ounces of steroids. What the heck, might as well throw it on the slide, right? So the neighborhood police unit really shows you what a proactive group of officers that aren't necessarily chasing calls for service can do to this community. And we look forward to being able to, at mid-year review, showing you what six months of these guys' work looks like. These guys, we, we pick the right people. We've got the right leadership and the right officers on the street that are out there making this happen. And uh, we congratulate them every day for the hard work that they're doing to take care of the criminals that are victimizing this community and to solve bigger projects. So if you look at what community policing is, it's, it's actually looking at problems and solving them at the root causal level. So for instance, if you look at the Reading Inn, it was the operation of the business. And with the DA's office, we were able to get compliance, hopefully, from the owner of that business so that he operates it properly. And these guys are, have that time, because they're not chasing calls for service, to look into cases deeper. And that's why you see those drug search warrants and those bigger arrests, and they've actually linked a drug sales search warrant to property crime that have been stolen property and linking that from house to house of where that property is going and they're really, really doing, I can't say enough about what these guys have done just in a six week time period. And with that, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Just do me a favor, please, and do everybody else in the room a favor. If you have an individual issue, I have two, sorry, I have a lieutenant and a sergeant sitting around here somewhere. Where's Sergeant Barner? Oh, Sergeant Barner's around here somewhere. Uh, lieutenant Schuler's standing right over there. If you have an individual problem house or issue, um, please take that to Lieutenant Schuler. If you have a question that would be general interest to the rest of the group, please, I'll be happy to answer those. But uh, please keep it general questions. If you have individual issues, take those to Bill, and we'll try to get you some answers on those. Come on up, ma'am. There's microphones up here so everyone can hear you. Okay. We have done one human trafficking case um, in the Reading Police Department since I've been chief. Um, quite frankly, um, those cases are very, very difficult. Um, it's very, very difficult to... <laughs> the face of prostitution has changed, and we need, as a profession, to view prostitutes more as exploited victims than as the criminal themselves. Now, that's not to say that there's not people out there that are doing prostitution just to make extra money. But when it comes to these young women that are being trafficked, 
that's a huge issue. And the one that we had, luckily she escaped. She was held against her will, and she ran to somebody that had the intestinal fortitude to stand up to those that kidnapped her and held her until we got there and were able to do that investigation and get that conviction, which was, which was recently sought through the courts. The most difficult part about human trafficking, and I, I just went to a conference down in Sacramento on this the other day, is the federal government is really focusing on trying to divide human trafficking into human trafficking for labor versus human trafficking for sex. The human trafficking for sex is what gets most of the media attention, obviously. Um, we don't have a lot of the instances of human trafficking for labor, mainly because we don't have as much farm labor in our community or other issues. The concern and the hard part is, is that prostitution has changed and the street has now moved to the internet. And it's very difficult to get those investigations started. It's very difficult to infiltrate those organizations and be able to get the victim, who's the trafficked girl that's being forced to work as a prostitute, to turn on those that are trafficking her. So in some of these large organizations, and I don't know if those are in Reading or not, we haven't been able to get into those organizations really to find out, but most of what, in talking to the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Bureau of Investigations that do a lot of this stuff down in the Bay Area, the hardest part is when you get in, is to get the victim to turn on the trafficker. And a lot of that has to do with, according to them, that these organizations go all the way back to where they came from and where they were trafficked from, and they have family there. So that's going to be a huge challenge for us. And right now, we do not have a vice unit that focuses and is trained and equipped to be able to go do some of those types of investigations. And, and we'll, we'll work on getting, we have put in some grant um, request to actually get the equipment that we need to be able to do that, and we'll get our officers off to some training. But I don't know the scope of, the, of a human trafficking um, in Reading because we haven't been able to get in and do as many of those investigations because of those re reasons. Does that make sense? Okay. Anybody else have a question? Otherwise, we're going to, I'm going to have an early dinner. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I was just trying to find out what are we doing to get some of the heroin off the street? I know we don't have Cintiff anymore, do we? Yes, or we do. We just have it, but it's a small unit. Is that what it is? No, Cintiff has actually grown over the oh, last uh, year. Uh, Cintiff was down to about four agents, and now it's back up to, I think, nine. We actually now have a representative from the Department of Homeland Security. We have CHP is back. We have a probation officer back. Um, Reading Police Department have two there. Uh, the Sheriff's Department has one. Anderson PD is back in Cintiff. So Cintiff is up and strong. This is not our total drug arrest for the no, year. That's no. just those six guys for six weeks. Right. I know. I had talked to you one time over at mm -hmm. the City Council meeting. You had said that we just didn't have as many officers as we've had before. So I was just wondering how aggressive and if we are getting more aggressive or what's holding. Yeah, we've, re we've really kind of focused Cintiff towards methamphetamine and heroin. Um, and there's some, there's some larger cases that have been made that I'm not at liberty to talk about yet. Um, as soon as I get clearance from the U.S. Attorney's Office, we'll talk about those. But uh, they've been very successful, and we just got to wait for the clearance because we don't want to impede the future or the continued investigation or the prosecution of those cases. So I'd love to tell you more, but sometimes chiefs aren't allowed to do what they want to do. Yes, ma'am. The policy is done. Um, we have five vendors laid on to do a pilot program, and right now it's, it's being negotiated with the Reading Police Officers Association because it is a change in work condition. So hopefully that will get done and resolved quickly. Yes, ma'am. No. So what, what becomes, I mean, are they less, do you then populate a different area, or how does that work? Well, homelessness is not illegal. The camping is illegal. 
So we address the camping issue, but we don't have, basically what they do is they will go cite them for illegal camping, um, but based on court decisions and lawsuits that have taken place throughout the state, we actually have to, based on not wanting to be sued ourselves, on the advice of the city attorney, we tag the camp, we wait seven days, and then Bob goes back and cleans up the camps. Um, it's usually, we can do it, court decisions are saying like 72 hours, it usually is seven to 10 days because it takes Bob that long to route back around. Remember, it's one guy doing the cleanups. Um, so we, we wait a little bit longer than what's been established in the courts just so we don't get sued ourselves. But do we solve the problem by cleaning up the camps? No, we don't solve the problem, we move them. Um, but we have to clean up the trash and try to, it, one of the things that we can't ignore in all of that is the environmental damage that's being done. And we have to get that garbage up because otherwise it's gonna seep into our waterways and, and our, our underground water. So we do try to clean that up and stay on it as best we can. Um, but yeah, we do cite them, but they're also reading municipal code violations and we don't, not, aren't necessarily getting the prosecution of those. They get a letter from the DA if the person doesn't show up, that's kind of the, the end of it and that's not the desired outcome. Well, let's, let's be clear, not every homeless person commits crime, and not all criminals are homeless. So if you look at the city of Reading, and, and I, Mike is still running it for 2015, in 2014, only 1,100 people were responsible for 57% of our arrests. Over half of our crime arrests that we make is created by 1,100 people. I think if you look at that from a root causal level, it goes back to that drug addiction and mental health issue that I talked about. When we did our survey a um, year and a half ago, and Mike Thomas is here, he's our guy that goes out into the homeless camps as an officer. Um, between 50 and 60%, if my recollection is right, self-reported to us of the 200 or so that we talked to, that they suffered from mental illness and or drug addiction. So when you look at how are we gonna solve this issue, it really is a matter of gaining um, capacity in, the, in Shasta County in drug addiction intervention, mental health capacity. So that's why when I, when I talk about we're doing what we can with the resources that we have, that's not the end of my answer, by the way. It's that if we want the officers to divert them from jail to take them to a sobering center, the first thing we have to have is a sobering center. If we want the officers to divert mentally ill from a hospital bed or jail, we have to have a mental health outpatient or a crisis stabilization unit. And those things in Shasta County don't exist right now. So it really is a matter, I think, if we're gonna, if we're gonna address the issue in total, is I need staffing in my police department because this community is large and the customer service model we're delivering as far as our response times is not adequate in my view. And I've said that for going on five years now. But I think it's a, a balance between police staffing, jail bed space so that those career criminals that don't wanna change like the one I talked about that said, yeah, I don't even know how many I've done. If you say I did it, I did it because I, I've, I've lost track. That those guys can actually stay in the jail and get through the criminal justice system so that if the court determines that they deserve an opportunity, we as a criminal justice system, I think, have a responsibility to give them an opportunity to change. But they've got to make that choice. I can't make it for them. And if they don't want to make that choice, then they need a jail bed until they decide to make that choice. But we also have to couple that with the ability to, de to treat mental illness and drug addiction better and in greater capacity than we are right now. That's where I think the, the, the trifold comes in for this community as being able to deal with all three. Yes, sir. Well, I've got, I've got a lot of concerns about those, obviously, because I've got to police it. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know where you're going to put it, number one. Number two, how are you going to create the sanitation for it? And when you talk about self-policing, I don't know what that looks like. Because um, quite frankly, a lot of that aggravated assault right now is homeless on homeless crime, where they're beating each other up. So, you know, I, I don't know what that looks like. And, and you'd have to, I'd have to really look at a solid plan before I became an advocate for something like that. Yes, ma'am.
Well, you're not, you're not supposed to be firing rounds off in the city of Reading. And, uh, well, the sheriff's here. You could direct that, afterwards you could direct that question to him or Tom, if you want to come up, you can, you can come up and answer it now. <laughs> him. <laughs> you want Tom's phone number? Let me look it up. The, the chief's pretty quick with that finger there. <laughs> you would call uh, Shascom 245-6540. That's a 24-hour non-emergency number. And of course, if there's some type of endangerment or an emergency, 911. It is legal to shoot guns in the county in a safe and responsible manner. Uh, it can't do it like at midnight. So if they have some type of backdrop, uh, background, a mound to capture the bullets, hit the Generally, that would, well, depends on what's behind the plants and how far and what they're firing. That would not be in a safe manner. So if they have some type of backdrop, uh, yes, but uh, give us a call and we can investigate that. But generally, you're allowed to shoot guns and it depends on the type of gun, whether it's a shotgun if they're shooting trap or a high-powered rifle. So there's a lot of variables there. And what I can do is talk to you in the back and get some more details and your address and, and get the calls for service and turn it back to the chief. Certainly. Great. So I'll uh, come down and meet you in the back there. Thanks. Okay, if there's no more questions. Um, yes, sir. We, we do go to sentencing. Um, we are involved in that process and we do watch, and obviously if you read our press releases, um, we like to document how many times people have been arrested because it, it, I think it really does show this community you know, that we're responsive to these criminals and we're arresting them as much as we can. The problem that we have is that AB 109 shifted the prison population from the state of California to the sheriff. And the sheriff has not had time to build capacity to deal with, with that difference in that shift. The, count, the state did it very quickly. I'm not here to tell you that AB 109 is bad law, that local communities probably may be able to deal with criminals better, lower level criminals better than the state of California. But the state shifted it so quickly that counties didn't have a chance to build the capacity to be able to deal with it. Um, and that's, that's the biggest problem. The big problem that we're having in Shasta County right now is our reincarceration rate. We're reincarcerating at about a 10% rate. We're the only double digit county in the state of California, which now the state of California is actually threatening to take some of our state funding that funds things like the third floor of the jail and these programs from probation because our reincarceration rate is so high. So basically what you're telling me as a state is you're going to punish me for doing my job. Somebody commits a crime, we arrest them for that crime, the judges hold them accountable. But now, if you're sentenced under 1170H of the penal code, which is prison realignment, most of that falls under that. And they go to county jail under 1170H sentencing. Jail for reincarceration rate counts the same as state prison. So whether they're going to the state or whether they're going to the county, it still counts against Shasta County. And the judges, our judges, God bless them, still want to send people to jail. So, you know, it's, it's tough. Yeah, we know how many times we're arresting people. The courts know. The courts have people that don't show up to court and they got lists of 50 cases that are pending. We all know it. We all, but... If you can't hold them in jail long enough to get them through the court process, they never get to rehabilitation programs like that one. And we never get an opportunity to give them that chance. So that's why I say we're making progress on the right side of court. We're still struggling significantly, in my opinion, on the left. I will tell you that when we started Shasta County's Most Wanted two years ago, we had almost 600 people on a warrant list that were convicted of a crime and failed to appear at their sentencing. That program, since its inception, has arrested, been responsible for the arrest or turn-in of almost 600 people, and that, warrant, that same warrant list is now less than 300. So it's working, 
but we still have a ways to go. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, here's what I'd like for you to do. Lieutenant Bill Schuler, who's standing right over there, he actually sits on the One Safe Place board as my representative on that board. Can you can you give him that information and we can we can we can deal with that? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Right now we're sitting at 102 sworn, is what I'm authorized um, through July of 2017. Um, and since I've been chief of police, we have hired 40 in four years, and that's to fill retirements or those that leave or other, other issues. Right now, um, we have two vacancies. Um, our lateral pool or our experienced officer pool has not been coming in at the rate that we need to keep filling positions. So recently, we're gonna change our recruiting strategy a little bit. The Reading Police Department traditionally has been able to very passively recruit. We put out an announcement, when I first became chief, 39 lateral applicants or experienced police officers applied to be in the Reading Police Department. Retirement system change, higher retirement system, lower retirement system, they're just not coming. So our salaries are very competitive to the Valley, so we can still attract that. Um, but we have opened recruit level to where we're actually gonna send some people to the academy. Um, and then as soon as I open recruit level, I got five lateral applicants in the last two days. So. You know, it's, it's, you go to experiment with one and now, now all of a sudden it opens the floodgate in another. But, you know, we have been able to keep the quality of the Reading Police Department very, very high. You know, we're pushing about, which is odd in law enforcement in California, about 60% of our department has a bachelor's degree. Um, we're pushing about 20% with master's degrees. So we still have a very high quality um, police department of very good, good people. I'm very proud, you know, to be their chief. It's, it's a very unique group of people that go into law enforcement. Law enforcement fire in the military. It takes a different person to run to danger when others want to run away. And I'm very proud of the group that I have that I serve with every day. Yes, ma'am. Well, we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep, um, yeah, we, we actually put, when we arrest people, we usually have their mugshot as part of their, the news release that goes onto Facebook. Um, so if you are a friend of the Reading Police Department, you'll get those arrests and you'll be able to see. And uh, we, we try to um, highlight how many times they've been arrested so that you guys can kind of understand where the community is. It's not a dig on the sheriff. The sheriff manages bed space as best he can on any given day. Uh, the sheriff has about seven available beds, and we, the sheriff's department, averages about 60 bookings a day. So, no. Yeah, no, I, we'll, we'll, and we'll continue to do that. Yeah, if you look, if you look at the Reading Police Department arrests, that's an average of 23 arrests a day. And on any one day, Tom has about seven available beds. So it, it is going to still be a challenge until we can uh, increase that capacity. And I'll tell you, that 64-bed arc, that adult rehabilitation center that's going to go on Breslauer, um, this community wouldn't have that if we didn't have a sheriff that went down to Sacramento and fought for it. So congratulations to Tom for that. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Donnie, I know what you want to talk about. It's not appropriate for this venue, but I know what you're going to say. All right, Donnie, go for it. That's kind of odd. Just hand it to okay. him. He's going to be yeah. difficult no matter what. That's not being difficult. You let everybody else hold on to it. That's being ostracizing me and it's not right. 
I want to commend you for your time tonight. I feel remorse that this is the turnout for a town meeting. It's okay, we should have more. I appreciate the officers back there. I want to commend you on having less than 10 complaints filed against your department, three of which were because of excessive use of force. That's a pretty low number. You just heard the lady speak about three false arrests and you submitted him over, her over to there and hopefully that gets taken care of as well. And you're aware that I file complaints also and you talk about the benefit and the quality of your police station. I commend them also. The only one I've ever known is Boon Pan Konkebimon, which he has a difficult long last name like you say. That's why you just say Deputy Boon is Boon Pan Konkebimon. No, no that's, a, that's his name. You should be proud of it. At any rate, what do you do to stop police misconduct? I hear you speak about penal codes. There's a penal code 832.5, which I was exercising that constitutional right, and then I was physically assaulted by your officer. Donnie, it, you have a pending criminal case. I've told you I cannot talk what to I'm you saying about is your you've pending put my, criminal case. You have put my picture up on Facebook, unduly so. You are the one that sent me and your lieutenant to the records division. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you about it afterwards.